All right, good afternoon. Let's go ahead and uh, get started on the next panel as everybody's getting situated here. Um, Roger did an outstanding job of helping to uh, set us up and bringing it up to date of how we got to where we are. By the way, I'm Walt Falconer from Strategic Space Solutions. Glad to be here also um, on the uh, board of the AAS. So happy to uh, moderate this session and I really appreciate our panelists uh, helping us out today as we now turn from looking at the past to looking at the future. So I have brought with me today four of my favorite uh, fortune tellers that are going to tell us about the future and looking forward to um, what uh, they can uh, help us figure out where we're going and, and uh, such. I think Roger touched upon it as well. Uh, one of the difficulties I think we have, um, unlike our slogan here, more than you can imagine, I think the problem is, is we can imagine more than we can afford. Um, and that's the problem where we're at. Um, so I'm interested to each of our panelists are going to uh, kind of address this issue um, as we celebrate Yuri Gagarin's uh, anniversary, a uh, magnificent uh, anniversary, but also as we now look forward to what do we think is going to be happening in the uh, next 50 years. So I'm going to start off with... Um, Dr. Lori Leshen, and you heard her speak this morning. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the bios, but if you're interested in their backgrounds, they are very qualified in what they're talking about. Um, and so you can please come and talk to them afterwards at the reception, and, and I, I want to save at least enough time to get to the, the question and answer. But as you know, uh, Dr. Leshen is um, the Deputy Associate Administrator for NASA's Exploration Systems Mission Directorate and is playing a, a key role there in helping to uh, forge where we're going. And uh, prior to ES ESMD, she was, uh, of course, here at the Goddard Space Flight Center, as, she, as you know. So without further ado, Lori, please welcome her. Great. I don't know, Jay, if you've... Okay, that's it. Excellent. Well, hello again. Hello. Yeah, I uh, forgot to mention this morning that I was, I was standing in for Doug, who is obviously the AA of ESMD, who uh, had the pleasure of testifying before the House Science Committee this morning. So I hear it went well. I was up here, so couldn't watch. But uh, So uh, this was actually the, the talk I was asked to give here, which I'm, I'm thrilled to do. And, and you'll see some commonality with the remarks I made this morning if you were here then. But I'm trying to step back here and, and talk a bit more about um, the why and how we've arrived at this um, at the different components of our human exploration program going forward. And then we'll hear from some great folks that are, are working with us on some of those programs so you'll get a little more, bit more detail I'm, I'm uh, thinking on, on these individual components going forward. Um, why don't you go to the next slide? So I always like to start at the very highest level of, of asking why we do this. And we just heard a great talk that um, had a good discussion about why people explore and again this is this is my these are my words this isn't taken from any NASA document somewhere so this is literally my thinking about why it is that we do what we do and why I am motivated each and every day to come and try and make this happen and I truly and firmly believe in my gut that um, you know it, that uh, exploring cultures prosper and prosperous cultures explore and and that this is really a, about prosperity and the future prosperity of our of our nation and of our species and so I think we explore to prosper um, and that includes things uh, like discovery is as a major driver for exploration uh, both in low earth orbit and beyond and actually frankly both human and robotic uh, to, to address those grand challenges those questions that can only be answered by by being there by going and uh, being in the right environments and exploring the unknown um, innovation I think that's a word we hear a lot these days it's a very fashionable word but it's really true when it comes to space exploration not only are we attempting to do things that are, let's face it, just about impossible, correct? Just about impossible to do. So by definition, we've got to create things that can't be imagined, at least in enough detail, to make them work. And we create them, we uh, invent them. Uh, and of course, this ends up with great jobs and also emerging markets. And so I, I want to, at this point, say, 
this presentation is mostly going to focus on the Beyond Leo part of our of our uh, mission because one of the panel that we have here, but also because we have an entire commercial space flight panel tomorrow that's really going to focus on that. And I strongly recommend you come and hear what those wonderful folks have to say. But in my mind, again, and I mentioned this this morning, creating this commercial capability for human space flight in Leo is a fundamental cornerstone of our broader strategy for NASA to focus on sending humans beyond Leo. We've got to make both of these work in order to make, to have each of them be successful. That is, NASA needs to keep its gaze firmly on the frontier, and we need to make sure that activity in LEO is increasing and becoming increasingly uh, accessible to many, not just a few. So to me, that's extraordinarily exciting, and we'll be creating new markets in ways that um, you should ask the panel about tomorrow in more detail. So again, I think they're, they're very linked and very important. And of course, the third is that what we do um, in inspires people, it fundamentally touches their imaginations and sparks it. And again, that's true on both the, the human and robotic side. Um, I've had personal experience with this where I uh, you know, spent a lot of my career studying little meteorites from Mars in a teeny tiny lab in a basement of a building and uh, got a call saying, you know, well, one of these we think has fossils in it. Remember this, 1996, life on Mars and the meteorite? And I couldn't believe it. It was great. But sure enough, the next day, it was the front page headline on every single newspaper in the entire world. And the president was talking about these meteorites I used to study in my little tiny lab under the stairs. So the work that we do inspires people. And so that, to me, in itself, is a, is a highly valuable commodity, especially these days. So to me, it's all about prosperity and these components of it. Next. Um, so we can talk a little bit, and I didn't talk about this this morning, and it's probably totally unreadable, and I apologize, uh, but about where we're going beyond low Earth orbit and why. There is a bounty of opportunity for human explorers, and, and as you probably know, I'm a scientist in a sea of engineers in the, in the human space flight world, um, and part of what drives me to make this successful is the extraordinary bounty of opportunity that we have in these different destinations. And what I want to talk about today is this concept of a capability-enabled framework for human exploration. That is, it's not about a single destination with a date stamped on its forehead. This is about enabling the ability for humans to go to lots of places throughout our solar system over time as we develop the capabilities to get them there, reaching ever farther, ever further as we go. And you'll hear some about the first capabilities we need to enable those early destinations, and the idea is to build a steady cadence over time so that this program is sustainable and it's here to stay. So that being said, there's a lot of great places to go. That includes um, high Earth orbit, uh, geosynchronous orbit, and Lagrange points, those sort of deep space kind of destinations that uh, where we can uh, understand uh, operations in microgravity and building things beyond low Earth orbit where we can, uh, where there might be interesting uh, scientific experiments that could be done and constructed in these environments. So there's a lot of potentially interesting things to do there. And staging for further deep space missions uh, to LEO as well. Earth's moon, as we heard this morning, still very much on the table, still very much a destination of interest from a, a deeper exploration perspective, understanding uh, the moon's history scientifically is fascinating. The moon is a witness the first half a billion years of solar system history of, that have been cleverly erased by our own planet and its plate tectonics. Um, the moon also has uh, resources that have potential, as we again have heard, uh, have potential economic benefit. And so the, the moon is very much of interest. Near-Earth asteroids, fascinating objects uh, that both, again, get, can tell us compelling science because they're the building blocks of the planets. They are the earliest remnants of the, the formation of our solar system, can tell us about where where the water and the organic material on our own planet came from. Um, also, occasionally, they change the course of, of uh, the history of life on our planet. They've changed it quite dramatically. It'd be nice to know and understand um, how to uh, avoid that in the future, if possible. So planetary defense very much plays into the conversation about near-Earth asteroids. And again, they may have, uh, have great space resources. They're also great stepping stones for Mars because the length of those missions is, is sort of intermediate between quite short lunar missions and quite long Mars missions if you if you pick the right asteroids. So NIAs are very exciting. And of course, Mars and its moons, 
I probably don't have to explain to anybody in this room the fascination with Mars as sort of, I would say, our, our horizon destination for humans in the near term. Personally, I want, you know, the Star Trek, I want to go beyond the solar system, but, but in terms of our near term, Mars is really uh, quite an exciting place potential for life um, in terms of setting up long-term habitation beyond Earth. I think Mars is where most of our minds uh, go to. So, and, and again, internationally, Mars is a, an object of, of a lot of interest. So, fantastic opportunities for these human explorers. I think it's very easy for us to get caught up in the rocket design and the capsule design and all this stuff, and that's great. We've got to worry about that. We've got to do that. I think it's important to remember why we're doing this is to get to go explore these extraordinary places. Next. So, what does this look like? What do we mean by uh, a capability-enabled framework? So, when the President's Budget came out last year, it, I think to a lot of people, looked like a lot of pieces that didn't fit together well into a sort of the, an integrated story or wasn't that transparent. And one of the first things we did was to stand up a group we called HEFT, the Human Exploration Framework Team, to kind of put together what's going to be the framework for the future of human spaceflight and how can we make decisions about which investments we need to make, which are the most important, highest priority capabilities we need to develop, which things are applicable broadly, which things are applicable more narrowly. How can we make priority decisions? And so we set up this group called the HEFT, and if you hate the acronym, that's my fault. I made it up. Um, but. Uh, and one of the things they really came out with at the end was this concept of building up this incremental capability over time. Now, for those of you com familiar with the Augustine Committee report, it sounds a lot like the flexible path. It's quite similar, actually. Um, but, but I think we, we made it our own at NASA through this process of, of the heft, which is a good thing. We, we have sort of embraced this now for ourselves, the concept of moving out ever um, further and further beyond beyond the Earth. So gaining the high ground, that is getting out of low Earth orbit, uh, but still being in the Earth's vicinity, then going to ever more challenging near-Earth asteroids, and eventually out to Mars. The lunar surface, the, the, lun the moon is in there. If you decide to take, um, to, to take a stop at the lunar surface, you can certainly do that, and that helps you in different ways. It's not quite as much in, the, um, in, the, in building the capabilities for the deep space destinations like near-Earth asteroids. You build different capabilities for the lunar surface, but those capabilities help you get to Mars. So there are pathways through this capability-enabled framework. So these are some of the those destinations again as we would build up capability over time and the idea here is that now we can step back and say oh okay I can see if we're gonna kind of expand as we go now we can step back and say what are the different capabilities we need for each of these destinations next and that's what um, I have to spend a great deal of time doing and the great news again is the Authorization Act and the President's budget both all fund all support the elements of the program that came out of the heft so I think actually we've actually got much better alignment than people probably feel in their gut sometimes, like we're, we're not quite congealed yet. I think we are. I think we've got the components we need to move forward powerfully here. And again, I talked about this this morning, the three pieces, the low Earth orbit piece that includes the ISS extension and its critical research as well as uh, the commercial crew support and cargo support to, to make sure the ISS is supported. It includes the, the launch vehicle and crew vehicle, the SLS and MPCV, as those essential first capabilities capabilities to get us beyond LEO. We need those wherever we go. Let's get going on them, and this budget supports that. Um, and finally, that, that required supporting research technologies capabilities uh, beyond the SLS and MPCV that we know we need, things like that little vehicle there in the middle, in the middle on the right, which is a concept for a space exploration vehicle that would um, you know, rover, hover around an asteroid or can be turned into a rover for roving around the moon that Charlie was talking about this morning, that great rover. It's based, that's, that concept is based on that. Next. So again, if we start to map out our destinations across the top here, going again from that geo high Earth orbit, um, and Lagrange points could be part of that as well as a destination, lunar orbit and vicinity, lunar surface, um, different asteroid missions, and finally Mars, moons, and Mars, along with the capabilities we need. And again, this is simplified, okay? This is a sort of simplified version. I have spreadsheets and spreadsheets of very, very detailed capabilities on who needs what where. Have produced that for us, did a fantastic job. But what we can see, again, the first two lines are our space launch system and our multipurpose crew vehicle. We need those wherever we're going. So that's why we're investing in them now. There are other capabilities that are needed in in some, most, um, 
And what you can see is any and all destinations need at least something else. So we do need to be investing in other things as well, like advanced spacewalking capability or long duration habitats or that space exploration vehicle, in space propulsion, um, in surface capabilities. But we can, over time, build up these other capabilities as these vehicles are developed, as we do our investments in the other advanced capabilities to enable us to go further into the solar system. So that's the concept of the capability enabled framework. It says, look, we don't have to have the destination with the date stamp. We know these are things we need. Let's start investing in them now. Let's get going. Next. So uh, that's all I'm going to say about this, but I think that our future is really about um, committing to a sustained presence for humans in multiple destinations, and really that is what we're about. Um, it's about opening the solar system and creating that sustainable future. This is a very different approach than, than NASA has taken for deep space exploration in the past, and so I think it's a little bit of a reimagination of the future of human spaceflight. Next. But you know, Star Trek went from its, its, its old persona to the new, hip, cool persona and reimagined itself in a more modern version. And what I say is, if they can do it, why not us? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. That helps us get a better perspective of what the, at least the thinking is and how that ties into the roadmap at uh, ESMD. Uh, next up, I'm going to move, move on to uh, invite uh, Cleon Lacefield. He's the vice president of the Orion uh, program uh, at Lockheed Martin and has been working on, obviously, Orion as part of the Constellation program, and now it's what part of the MCPV whatever program. Oh, sorry. I can't, it rolls off the tongue. Um, program, so we're very interested in seeing how that all is playing out in this uh, new adjustment as Lori just uh, painted for us. So let's welcome Cleon. Thank you very much, Walt. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to really talk about uh, some of the accomplishments that we've had on the program. Um, and, and I would like to emphasize that with this program, we have a very young design team, so I was very pleased to see uh, the young students here today. 35% of our team is under 30 years old. So you have us old timers that are mentoring that next generation that is coming in. And so our young designers are, are I think, are really getting the experience base that they need you know, for the transition that we're undergoing in our business. If we, if we kind of think about uh, uh, what Lori just talk, talked to us about, I would like to show the accomplishments today, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what technologies and what is the state of the art that we have in the Orion vehicle, and then it's our imagination of how we would take uh, stepping stones forward. And I can do that where they have a lot harder time doing that because they're in the middle of a lot of uh, program reorganization and um, technical things that uh, uh, they, they need to uh, work on their architecture. Uh, so could I have the next chart, please? When we look at the Orion vehicle, um, we have the launch abort system, uh, the capsule, uh, the service module. Um, and when we think about this system, I think it's important to note that the launch abort system has the, uh, set the design loads for this vehicle. Getting the crew safely away from this vehicle on the ground is what has set the design loads on the vehicle. A lot of people think, well, it's the, you know, it's the re-entry, it's the, it's the long duration space. Uh, that's not it at all. Uh, what has set the loads on the capsule is the landing loads. And remember, we've set up this system so that um, we can have a shootout, uh, the crew is still safe. Even if we accidentally land on land, the crew is still safe. And we've done that with, uh, with a lot of uh, design uh, help from a lot of uh, people in this room and from a, a lot of help on the, the NASA and contractor team to pull that off. I think it's interesting to note that when we look at this vehicle, everyone says, well, it looks like Apollo. Well, this vehicle is based for a minimum stay in space of six months. 
uh, the maximum time that we can stay in space is three years. And so when you look at the technologies uh, that we've brought on board, and we'll talk those in, in just a second, uh, you start thinking of the technologies that are going to be needed in the future, which is the uh, long duration environmental control systems, radiation, um, and one of the interesting things, the number one loss of crew for a vehicle like this is the micrometeorites that Laurie was talking about earlier. That is the number one, by an order of magnitude, the, the primary um, thing that we've had to design the vehicle about to make sure that we do not lose the crew. So there's a lot of um, testing that we've done at the uh, NASA facilities looking at slowing down the velocities and, uh, and absorbing the velocities and being able to uh, fix wherever we have hits. And I think it's interesting that when you kind of think about what does a long duration vehicle have to do, it has to be able to get you back from the far side of the moon, it has to be able to get you back with a propulsion failure, a computer failure, a hole in the cabin, all of those things are built into this vehicle. Can we have the next chart, please? One of the things, uh, and we'll, I'm going to show a little video on this in just a second, but one of the things that we were really happy about was the, um, the pad abort test that we had last, uh, last year. And in this test, we actually come off the vehicle, and then we actually do an entire 180 maneuver to drop the um, capsule on the right um, orientation so that we can get the chutes open. This gets the uh, crew up and away from the vehicle in three seconds. So it, it says a lot to the safety that we're trying to build into this vehicle. Next chart. When we, when we think of, um, and I know there were some questions about this earlier, when we think about uh, building this next generation system, you know, one of the things that has been evident is that, uh, especially with the Constellation program, and something that um, both our team and the NASA teams have really struggled with is putting together a, a uh, multi-vision capable vehicle. This vehicle can be reused up to 10 times. Um, but trying to do that in an affordable manner within um, the processes that we have today. So one of the things that we have worked very hard on is how do we get affordability into these systems and build the affordability in from the start. So one of the main things that we've done is to make the system um, almost totally reusable. And when I say totally reusable, um, we aren't quite there with the heat shield, but we're very close, I think. And so when you think about reusing all of these systems, reusing all the avionics, turning this vehicle in a couple months and being able to refly it, which we will actually, uh, with this vehicle, we're going to demonstrate on a launch abort system that we can do that. Um, you start lowering the cost of doing business dramatically. <coughs> And when you think about um, all the paperwork uh, and the processes that are utilized, and you think of this vehicle from um, a flight test vehicle versus an in-item production vehicle, it allows you to um, test a little and um, design a little as you go through the process. And then at the end of the process, you have the big paperwork that um, get you to a flight system that you can go forward with. And that alone has, um, has allowed us to drop uh, several hundred million dollars off of this contract. Just that. Uh, just going to a just-in-time um, software development system has dropped another several hundred million dollars off the contract versus the way we do business today. So there are, there are some concrete examples of what you can do to lower costs and um, to operate in more of a commercial environment. I think um, the biggest thing um, that the government programs can learn is how to operate in that environment and r transition that environment into the exploration arena. Uh, next chart, please. 
This is one of the largest heat shields ever built. And now we have assembled it onto the bottom of the ground test article. Uh, the ground test article that we showed the capsule before, um, we'll be going through a whole series of tests on uh, vibration, acoustics, and uh, drop tests at Langley here next year. Uh, next chart, please. Uh, from a, a propulsion arena, we have tested all of the propulsion systems uh, on Orion. Uh, we, have, um, we have completed the uh, qual testing on the, um, the uh, crew module. Uh, we have uh, completed all of the development testing on the OME and the uh, service module. Next chart, please. Uh, one of the things that we are very proud of is the advance in uh, avionics. Um, we are flying the uh, STORM experiment, which is a, uh, a navigation experiment on the next shuttle flight. Uh, they will actually dedicate a day uh, to us on that shuttle flight to show the uh, state-of-the-art system. This is far in advance uh, to what the shuttle is capable of today. Uh, next chart, please. Um, the next... Um, the next part I'd like to show you is kind of the stepping stones, um, and this is how we would we could go forward. We would like to uh, see a, an early test flight of the vehicle in 2013. We'd like to see Todd's vehicle in 2016, um, and then we'd like to be able to start doing um, work with either the asteroids or the moon by the end of this decade. And this is our imagining. Now we, we realize that to pull this off, we have to be affordable. We have to do business differently than what we have in the past. But I think we're all up to the challenge of uh, going down that path. And so what I'd like to show is a little bit of um, the progress and of where, we've come in, where we're uh, coming from, uh, what we've completed to date, and then uh, how we could go forward, if it works. as NASA flies out the remaining space shuttle missions to complete construction of the International Space Station, one of the world's most amazing engineering accomplishments and one that will serve as a test bed for new scientific discoveries. Now, our nation prepares to embark on a bold new journey to send humans to new destinations with a multi-purpose crew vehicle. Lockheed Martin leads the industry team developing the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle, the nation's next generation state-of-the-art human spaceflight system capable of multiple missions to a variety of interplanetary destinations. The spacecraft is slated to launch into orbit for its initial test flight in 2013. After being proven safe and reliable, Orion will set out into the cosmos to take humans to destinations never explored before, such as asteroids, Lagrange points, and other deep space expeditions that will put us on an affordable and sustainable path to Mars. For more than 50 years, Lockheed Martin has been building spacecraft to withstand the extreme demands of launch and re-entry environments, and safety is always our primary concern. In fact, many of Orion's motors and systems have already been tested and validated to ensure optimal crew safety. The most significant test performed last year was Pad Abort 1 a flight test of Orion's launch abort system. Three, two, one, launch, launch, launch. 
The test, performed in New Mexico and simulated using Lockheed Martin investment hardware and software, was 100% successful. The abort system worked flawlessly as its 500,000 pounds of thrust propelled the test spacecraft a mile up and a mile away from danger, allowing it to parachute safely back to Earth. Visual confirmation of landing. Another significant milestone is completion of the first Orion ground test vehicle, which was built at NASA's Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans, Louisiana, and shipped to Lockheed Martin's Denver facilities to be integrated with thermal protection systems prior to testing. This vehicle will be subjected to rigorous thermal testing, vacuum chamber tests, and every possible extreme environment and condition it will encounter during launch, spaceflight, and re-entry. These performance tests will prove out the design and integrity of the spacecraft. As proof of our commitment to the future of United States spaceflight, Lockheed Martin has built a state-of-the-art facility to develop and test spacecraft rendezvous and docking missions from concept to flight vehicles. The Space Operations Simulation Center in Denver, Colorado provides an ultra-stable test environment for precision instruments and accurate navigation systems used in space vehicles. The development, evaluation and testing of these elements are necessary requirements to ensure success of human and robotic missions to Earth orbiting platforms, planets, moons and other bodies in our solar system. The center also tests systems for ranging, rendezvous, docking, proximity operations, imaging, descent, and landing systems. As we venture further into space, this facility will provide the foundation of a capability to reduce the risks inherent in space travel. Using complex simulation models, the Space Operations Simulation Center team will be able to verify Orion's capability to take astronauts to the International Space Station, the Moon, asteroids, Mars, and beyond. Referred to as stepping stones, this proposed plan for space exploration introduces a series of increasingly challenging exploration missions that build incrementally and affordably towards America's long-term goal of exploring Mars. Each mission to the Moon, distant asteroids, and finally to the moons of Mars will develop technologies and demonstrate new capabilities. At each destination, astronauts will address key science objectives relating to the formation of the solar system and the origins of life. Joint telerobotic and human exploration missions can greatly expand our scientific understanding of distant worlds. Astronauts in orbit can control rovers on the surface of planets to collect samples from locations of possible biological interests. A mission to Mars could be undertaken as soon as 2030. Upon their safe return from the journey of a lifetime, the astronauts will return to the safe hands of NASA ground crews. Similar to Apollo, the astronauts will land in water and be retrieved. Orion has already tested many of these operations. The success of crew return methods is folded back into the design as the team prepares for production and assembly. Lockheed Martin brings premier human spaceflight and space exploration expertise in the development of this next generation crew space transportation system. Our collective expertise in large-scale systems integration, planetary exploration, human spaceflight systems and operations, and launch vehicles provides a critical foundation for NASA's human spaceflight programs. Orion, the next step in human spaceflight. Thank you. Thank you, Cleon. Our next uh, speaker, to, again, to give us a different perspective, 
um, is Dr. David Mendel, uh, historian and electrical engineer and uh, Devner professor of history and engineering at the manufacturing and professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT. So I'm looking forward to a different perspective. So let's welcome David. Thank you. Um, I guess maybe I'll start with an anecdote listening this morning. Um, and that's an anecdote from uh, actually undersea exploration where I've worked for 20 years or so, uh, building robots and diving in submarines. And in 1998, I was uh, on an expedition uh, with Dr. Robert Ballard to discover the Titanic to look for the wreck of the Yorktown, uh, the aircraft carrier that was lost in 1942 in the Battle of Midway, um, off the island of Midway. and. Um, it was a, a needle in a haystack problem, as these things always are. And we towed a sonar around for a bunch of days and you know, had some OK guesses as to where the thing sank. And um, five or six days into our expedition, uh, it turned out actually that the, the, um, the sonar had an extremely accurate depth sounder on it, in addition to the side scan sonar, the kind of side looking imager. And on the side looking imager, the number said the aircraft carrier was going to be about three pixels wide. It was that difficult of a problem. And about five or six days into the mission, uh, one of the technicians from the University of Hawaii who was working with the data called us all over and said, I think you really want to have a look at this. The depth sounder imagery from the first day has a bump in it that's about 150 feet wide and about 75 feet high, and that pretty much matches the profile of the Yorktown. Um, and lo and behold, uh, we went down and visited a couple days later with a, a remotely operated vehicle, and there was the Yorktown. We had gone over it the first day um, in our mapping exercise, but sort of found it on the fifth of the sixth day. And I, I, I tell you this uh, anecdote um, to, to, because what I want to do in my remarks is raise the question of where is the exploration happening? Um, and in that case, we found that shipwreck in the data as much as we found it on the seafloor. And we were exploring the data and continue to explore the data for a very long time after we were actually out collecting it. And one of the things that, that we learned from undersea, and I think people in, in space flight have learned that quite a lot as well, is um, a lot of the best exploration has to do with mapping and very precise mapping. And then we are explorers of the data. Um, and so I've written before um, in a report actually titled with the same title as our panel, The Future of Human Spaceflight, with my MIT colleagues in 2008, um, about this question that, that Roger Launius raised and several other people have raised about um, why are we flying people into space? And in that report, we sort of thought it through and said there are really two kinds of objectives. The one kind of objective, what we call primary objectives, are those that only humans can do and only humans will ever be able to do. And the secondary objectives are things that are extremely good for humans to do if you're there, but aren't going to justify the cost and the risk in the political process that we live with on the ground. Um, and strangely enough, when you think it through that way, um, it really is the things like political pride, prestige, international competition that, that provide um, and, and not least of them, the expansion of the realm of human experience that provide this realm of um, primary objectives for human spaceflight. Because one of the things that goes un unmentioned a lot in the imaginaries of the 50s and the Apollo era and all of the history that Roger shared with us is that for all that imagination, no one imagined the progress of computation and information technologies and communications that we've seen. And um, that to a very great degree has changed the equation. So um, Dr. Leshen mentioned this morning in her talk about the mission of e ESMD um, to expand human presence into the solar system. Um, and the, the conversations both in the history that I've studied and worked in and the current ones constantly come back to for human spaceflight, these questions about experience, human experience, presence. What is it that we gain by presence? And as a robotics engineer and a sort of engineering skeptic, I tend to think that all the sort of details, remember that von Braun's original vision for human role in the space station was to get out and change the film uh, on the space telescopes and bring the canisters back. And all of these sort of tactical human abilities are 
are, are very frequently um, overtaken by various techno uh, technological changes, um, except for some of these sort of core experiences. And if you talk to the Apollo astronauts today, they'll often say, you know, it was the experience of landing on the moon, that was the thing that we really took with us that's the most lasting piece. So my question then is, um, what does it mean to have a human spaceflight program that takes that goal seriously and really looks at those goals? Because and I'll, uh, uh, to be provocative, any other rationales for human presence are always going to be overtaken by other types of technological change. Um, so I'll suggest three of them today. Uh, well, let me, let me step back on that a little bit. I want to I quote my uh, colleague and friend Stephen Pine, who's written a very good book on Voyager, which really sort of thinks this problem through as well and thinks about the problem of exploration. Um, um, and he puts it this way, the fact is exploration itself cannot long command the political will and cultural commitment it needs unless it can rally deeper justifications. Deeper justifications than curiosity appeals to some generic imperative, hyperspace rhetoric, or very expensive and often very arcane science. Um, the power of exploration at any given moment derives from the power it shares with its sustaining society. And again, Roger's been very clear about what that power was during the Cold War. We're much less clear about that now. The more deeply it can draft from that culture, the more interest it can tap, the more robust will be exploration support and the richer its impact. But something has to hold those pieces together. And I think in a lot of the conversations we've heard this morning and in general, we're really looking for that something. So let me suggest um, three things. Um, they're actually a little bit mundane. Um, except for the last one in a certain way, um, but I think they all build, that could make uh, a human and remote exploration program a little bit more compelling. Um, one is to be more open and inclusive of other ways of doing business. We've heard some of that just in the previous talk. One is to be more open to experiment, and the other is to be more forward-looking in the integration of remote and autonomous systems with human presence. Um, on other ways of doing business, um, I'm going to go quickly through this piece, actually, but um, I want to draw a little uh, attention to, in the discussions of the retirement of the shuttle, you were frequently seeing profile these incredibly impressive people who work on the shuttle and, you know, use the putty knife to refine the foam on the bipod ramps. And this sort of, it's a wonderful historical documentation of all of the human labor that's gone into both constructing the shuttle when the pieces are new in the tanks and turning around the existing orbiters. Um, and as an amateur craftsman myself, I have tremendous respect for those people, and I think in many ways they represent the best of our country. Um, as a historian of technology, I look at those practices and I say, that's pre-industrial. That's craft technology, okay? Um, and we're living with a space transportation system that is literally early modern. Um, and in ways that we're used to thinking about the early 19th century more than the 20th century. Um, so it's very interesting to think about what will spaceflight look like as it is truly brought into the industrial era. Um, and given that that era may well lag the industrial era in things like manufacturing by perhaps a century, maybe even longer. Um, similarly, I constantly see, and I see it woven through a lot of the presentations we've seen today, um, there's still, I teach a lot of, to engineering students at MIT about values. What are the values that are embedded in your technology? And I still see in space hardware values of complexity, of giantism, of lots and lots of human labor built in. Um, and these are values that have largely been moved on from in, in, in other industrial settings. We've heard that many mentioned a little bit. Um, you know, you constantly hear, and a little bit less now than you might used to, the, the shuttle is the most complex machine ever built, or the ISS is the most complex. You know, t to my engineering mindset, that's not something you brag about, actually. <laughs> Complexity is something that you manage. You try to eliminate whenever you can, but and then you manage it in a slightly embarrassed way in places where you really can't get rid of it. And so, um, what I'm getting at is, is I think there's really a wonderful and very important place for the new commercial companies to be involved in human space flight. And I should say, I'm a huge fan of what's going on and the change in direction we've seen in the last couple of years. There's a lot of uncertainty and it, it's very difficult for people whose livelihoods depend on that. Um, but at the same time, the, the Constellation program was headed very nowhere very fast, in my opinion. So I'm not being critical. And I think that the, um, the commercial companies 
um, well, by, by definition, particularly the more startup companies have more thinking about lean, more thinking about small, by definition being forced to think about uh, solutions of simplicity, simplicity um, and there's just, especially if you're a true believer, and I'm, I'm not always sure if I am, but if you have the religious conviction about human spaceflight leaving the planet, how can we say that the one way we've learned how to do it through this one government agency is the only way to do it? Um, we know, we know from the last 50 years of scholarship in the history of technology that technologies reflect their organizational contexts, and they sh take the shapes of the things, and again, Roger did a great job of showing how the, the, the setting um, uh, that led to, to NASA created the way that business is done. Has its successes, has its failures. Maybe in the long run, it'll, we'll see that that's the, really the best way to do it. But we can never say that with any assurance until we try not just one, but many different ways. And again, I think the key is commercial companies um, more than any one. Um, Okay, um, number two, being more open to experiment and research. Um, I sat in the audience here last year, um, and I had a remarkable presentation about salmonella research on the station and on the shuttle. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, very impressive work, um, all kinds of potentially important implications. Um, but very crucially, in that conversation, and in the presentation, um, and in most of what I've read from NASA about that work, there's no mention about why it required a human space flight to do that work. And as near as I can tell, most of the human involvement in experiments involved an astronaut sort of turning a crank on a canister to activate the experiment. Um, I've done some reading online for the uh, AMS, the Alphamedic Magnetic Spectrometer, just the user manual. Um, and as near as I can tell, there's very little human input on the on-orbit humans of what that does. It's all sort of a remotely operated system. Yes, it needs the power and the sort of mass and other things from the station itself. Um, um, but it's not clear to me what about that requires human presence. Um, furthermore, I'd say we actually know extremely little in a rigorous scholarly, particularly social scientific sense, of how science is really conducted, has been on the shuttle, is being conducted on the station. Um, how much do these environments really resemble laboratories in the terrestrial sense? Um, when are the crews actually experimenting versus running experiments that other people have designed that they may not know the innards of? Um, are, the, are they principal investigators or are they performing like laboratory technicians? And I've, I've asked this personally of astronauts and they have very interesting things to say about. So, who is using the tool? Who are, who are tool users and who are scientists? Um, and actually the statistic I saw this morning of the 1,100 investigations that have been done on the station so far, there's a database there to begin looking at that kind of question about what's going on. And um, I think it's really simply astonishing how little studied and little published um, what people are actually doing in orbit are from a rigorous ethnographic social scientific perspective. Um, how can we even say what we should be doing when we don't really even know what we are doing? Um, we've got to open up space flight. We've got to collect the data, analyze it, and publish it in the same way we do um, in the other space sciences. And I would add that social science um, happens to be cheap, weightless, and doesn't involve a lot of toxic chemicals. Um, and um, now one place, and, I, and this actually, to underscore that point, I think one place where human space flight really is genuinely cutting edge is this sort of idea of remote operations in very complex environments, which is a very critical, very difficult human activity. And I wrote a book about the Apollo landing, and I said in the introduction of that book, even if you don't care at all about spaceflight, this is a case study about how people operate in high hazard, high complexity, real time, very heavily computerized environments. Um, that has a, a strong degree of general interest. For example, um, one wishes we knew um, how to operate n nuclear power plants remotely. And, in retrospect, it's sort of astonishing that we can't. And um, where are the remotely operated fire trucks? Um, seems like a pretty simple thing to make, actually. Um, so finally, I want to talk about um, human spaceflight being more embracing of mixing human and robotic modes of exploration. Um, this is obviously um, not a new idea for me. It's a bit of a buzzword. It's in the Augustine Commission report. It's in this national space policy. Um, and at least the human spaceflight uh, parts of NASA are making an effort. Um, unfortunately, the current one seems to be Robonaut, and my apologies to anyone here who worked on it, but as a robotics engineer, I'm always very 
uh, skeptical of robots that are too explicitly anthropomorphic. Um, the claim is that that humanoid robot will be able to use human tools in human environments better than other types of robots. Um, but forgive me, but it seems like the whole thing is being backwards here. It's putting, spending a lot of money putting a human environment into uh, an orbit setting and then building a robot that will operate in that human environment, um, that's about four steps away from what my engineering mind tells me would be the right way to go about it. Uh, moreover, um, it's being made by uh, a Detroit uh, a car company, um, which I'm not sure is really what industry that we would like human spaceflight to emulate. Um, the claim there in the station, and, and I really would love to be proven wrong about this, and I'm really very eagerly looking to see what the um, what the results are, um, but that this this system will work alongside human crew members as a teammate. And I've done a lot of um, research currently into what do roboticists mean when they say that, actually, because that's a big thing also in factory robotics and in um, a lot of the autonomous vehicle work that goes out on at MIT, and what sort of models of team operation are people using there? Um, and again, do we really even know how the human teams are working in space? I, I firmly believe that the people who have been there and who do it know a lot about it, but has it been documented and published in a formal scientific sense? Um, so I, to, to sort of wrap up, um, human spaceflight to me is fundamentally based on the idea, which is a 1950s idea, that remote presence is not real presence, and that being there somehow requires your physical body. Um, it's not at all clear to me that the students I teach in a classroom today um, who are under 30 or even in some cases under 20 accept that distinction, having grown up with the internet and remote presence and now even their social relationships are all mediated by electronic links. Um, and again, Stephen Pine really addresses this question, and I think in, in a way that captures a lot of the questions that have been raised today. Let me quote him again. The human presence is already a machine presence, but what is lost is the inherited sense that exploration must be done by human explorers on the scene and the human drama that goes along with flawed human actors. The argument, that is, is not that people are better at science, but they're better at exaltation and tragedy, and without the prospect for loss and strife, public interest in what he calls the third age of exploration will wane. And I think that's really right on, and that's one of the things we're grappling with, which is as we move into a greater sense of remote exploration, which includes people, um, and actually Harley Thronson and Dan Lester have recently written a very good paper about the, the issue of time delay, and, and, and that may be one of the things you really can't surmount with, you know, uh, it's fair to probably say we won't exceed the speed of light for, for data communication anytime soon, and um, and that, uh, that may be one. Um, I don't actually agree with a lot of what they said in the paper, but it's a very good paper and I encourage you to read it. And it is the kind of, exactly the kind of conversation we need to be uh, beginning to have that really hasn't been had. Um, for example, and this is probably why I don't agree with it, is, is that it's become increasingly clear that remote explorers d develop an incredibly valuable and rich sense of presence in their remote environments. I've seen this from 20 years of going to sea, um, both diving in submarines, but mostly operating remote vehicles for in, in deep sea ocean environments miles below. Um, and even NASA is learning this on the Mars rover missions. Um, I'll point you to uh, Bill Clancy out at Ames who's doing some really great studies of remote operations, particularly in the Mars operations. And he quotes one scientist as saying, we were all there together through a robot. Okay, um, so absolutely I'm a big fan of human presence, but one of the great obstacles that I think this community still needs to get over is let's, we need to change our idea of what human presence is. Um, the report we wrote in 08 and the Augustine Commission report, I'm pleased to hear it mentioned here today, says if it's really about time delay, and it may be, then you'll put people into orbit around Mars and have them drive vehicles on the surface. That's really a perfectly good solution. Um, I also, it's one of the reasons I thought Constellation was so poorly conceived is we've never done that on the moon. We have better rovers on the Mars than we have on the moon where the time delay is much, much shorter. Um, why don't we have the best possible Humvee size uh, telerobotic rovers on the moon uh, operating today. It's, I mean, Silicon Valley could make that pretty quickly. Um, so uh, I'll leave you uh, with just some of these questions. How then do we balance exploration and science in these, in these contexts? Um, and we really need to be thinking about what are the problems we're trying to solve? What are the ways we're going to get there? And 
in the ways that, in all the history that Roger talked about, um, space flight was so compelling to people and still is because it changes our senses of who we are, that this whole changing of what is human subjectivity, what is human presence, what does it mean to be there, that's a problem that's really going to compel people in the coming years. Um, and I'll just close with a little ad, which is that we're having a, it's a MIT's 150th anniversary this year, uh, and um, we're having a symposium April 26th and 27th in Cambridge to address exactly this issue issue across space flight, undersea exploration, actually, and also exploration of air and earth. Um, a lot of our MIT alumni astronauts will be there. John Grunsfeld, who I see back there, will be there. Um, and some of the Apollo folks, but also a lot of the people from the undersea realm to really address these questions across these disciplines. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, David, for giving us interesting uh, different perspective and also giving us the challenge to come up with a launch system that doesn't use a putty knife anymore. Um, and to address that issue, our last speaker <laughs> is in charge um, of the current activity uh, looking at the space launch system. It's uh, Todd May, who is the Associate Director for Technical Management at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. So let's welcome Todd. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we're running a little short on time, so I'll just say, and the winner is... <laughs> that, was, that was a joke. Uh, you know, it's great to be here in, in the backdrop of 50 years of, of human space flight, um, obviously with Gagarin, but uh, I would throw Alan Shepard into that. Uh, Alan, after all, did uh, have some manual control of uh, his capsule. Um, and, uh, and while we don't know what Gagarin was thinking while he was sitting on top of the Vostok, history does record um, what Alan Shepard was thinking uh, other than, I hope I don't screw this up, which was um, that every part on that Redstone rocket was uh, built by the lowest bidder. Uh, which brings me to my discussion. Let's go to the next chart. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, a lot of the other speakers have talked about the why. Um, there are many reasons. Um, I would add a few to some of the ones uh, Roger said earlier. Um, I think national security is a big one, um, and, and maybe that's glory, um, but it's also kind of a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and, and we, we probably shouldn't forget that the race kind of started back with Sputnik, and, and a lot of folks were scared at that time. Uh, we don't really have that, that fear right now of China other than just kind of this uh, little uneasiness that uh, you know they're moving out and and when they move out to do something they do they do get it done uh, as a data point go back and look at 1996 when they decided they wanted to do something with the Olympics and, and look at them in 2008 um, I would say that um, sometimes we do do it for the gold, sometimes um, we think about the future of generations to come. Sometimes folks set out from islands in the Philippines uh, to ensure the success um, because of some problem on the island. Um, I would tell you that that's probably another one that's out there. Um, I also think... Um, uh, global partnerships is a thing. I think um, I'll mention it again in a minute, but um, NASA's uniquely positioned in some ways to kind of get above the fray. I, I love the comment from Roger this morning that Kennedy was actually thinking about cooperating with the Russians in the human spaceflight program way back, way back then, uh, even before we had gone to the moon. Um, I think we also in, engage um, the public. Uh, that's really important, um, especially with the younger generation. Uh, David mentioned it, and in some ways I do feel like um, we've, um, we've lost them to some extent, and we're trying to gain them back. And, and we're kind of geeky, and we're not real good at, at gaining them the old-fashioned way, so we have to think of new ways to do that. Um, I would tell you, though, that, that Charlie has, has, has uh, asked us to personalize the why of NASA, and I was thinking about what David said. I, I, I use a lot of data, too. Um, when, when I want to go travel to the uh, first time I ever went to Russia or, or to Singapore, I get a lot of data. I go online, I Google map everything, I lay it all out, I, I get all the data I can get because I want to go there. I mean, I mean, I want to look at that data, I want to study it, I want to understand it, but what I want is the experience. Um, and when I really think about why I'm at NASA, 
um, and, and why I'm here, it's, it's really exploration. It's this desire within to push boundaries. I, I feel like we've kind of been all over this planet. We've, we, we've gone from uh, Mallory hitting the, the peak of Everest to folks that actually do all seven peaks in one season now. And, uh, and so I, I think um, space is kind of an infinite place to explore. And, and it, the, the promise of, of being able to go uh, and explore new places. I, I love the data. I, I was there when Phoenix landed on the moon. I, I flew down uh, the next day and was there when the first pictures started coming in and it was amazing. But all it did was make me want to go. It, it made me want to be there and see that for myself. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's go to the next page. So uh, th this chart, the real message here is not Civics 101, but if you kind of go through each one of these things over the last couple of years, uh, this chart is, and, and Lori's already touched on it, it's not really an, an if, uh, but a how and a what on uh, a heavy lift. And uh, it's just reiterating that, uh, particularly with the Authorization Act that, that Congress uh, passed and that the President has signed, and with the new budget this year specifically calling out SLS and MPCV, um, it, it's really not an if at this point. It's, it's just a, a how and a what. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so so um, this has also been touched on, but um, uh, kind of a way to think about it right now is, is we're at a time when uh, uh, I spent the first 11 years of my career working on the space station. Um, I moved to Houston when the program office moved there. I uh, moved back to Huntsville, worked on the airlock uh, to get it launched and uh, was in the building 4708 with every module being processed through there before it went to Kennedy. Uh, it is great to see that come to fruition. Um, that's a long time coming and we ought to, we ought to celebrate that achievement. Um, it, is, it is a great achievement for this country. It's a great achievement for the world. Um, and along those lines, you know, you see down here, this is the real why. Um, it, it's, it's pretty poignant, actually. Um, we reveal the unknown. We do and learn so that we benefit all mankind. Um, at that Phoenix landing, Buzz Aldrin was actually there at JPL. And one of the things he said that night uh, in a little symposium that he gave like at 1 a.m., uh, it was at a crazy time of day for us here on Earth. Um, but he, but he, he talked about when, when, when he came back and he read the, the press clippings and, and, and was seeing what folks were saying, they weren't saying the United States did it, they said we did it. Um, and there's a, something you see when you're out there in space, um, you see things a little differently, you don't see all the boundaries. And I think space station's a lot like that. Um, it allows us to reach across boundaries and cooperate in a way that sometimes, um, you know, we have a hard time here on Earth. And uh, I never see any fights going on between countries up on space station, and it has a way of reminding us that we're all in this together. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out here is that now that the space station is complete, it is time to uh, retire the shuttle and, and, and do it with dignity and honor. And uh, the center I come from has a lot of folks working that thing, um, and they take it very seriously, and um, they are going to finish strong. And, and this thing, they're going to finish it out with dignity. There are a lot of folks that um, are going to see this thing through all the way to the end. Um, but it's also time now to lay new foundations. And uh, Lori mentioned commercial crew. Um, that's a foundation to get to low Earth orbit, and it's time to, uh, to get that up and running. Uh, I can remember I was a deputy AA and the science mission director for a couple years, and uh, we were looking at, uh, at our launch vehicles at the time, and we were really interested in, in COTS coming along just for, for that reason. We wanted some more competition in that world, and so I've kind of been an Elon fan for years. Uh, and orbital too. Um, so, uh, but the next thing we want to do is to um, build the first exploration class uh, launch vehicle and spacecraft uh, since Apollo um, in the world. And, uh, and so it's time to lay the foundations for that. Let's go to the next chart. Lori already showed this chart, so uh, she, she kind of stole my thunder a little bit here, but the, the thing I'll point out in red is we're right down there in the foundation of this. This is a stepwise thing, and, uh, and you kind of start with an MPCV and an SLS if you want to explore. Uh, you've got to have exploration class uh, vehicles and spacecraft. Um, the thing that's different, and, and it's been touched on here, and, and I will tell you we get it, 
um, is that, that we cannot go hand build these things and we cannot chase complexity. Um, we have to do what the automotive industry has done, frankly, and, and that is to get smarter about the, the way we do it. We want to get our P&O costs down, that's production and operations. Um, we're, we're targeting half. Uh, what it was before, or maybe better. And, and the idea is we create the wedge for all those things up on the top. If, if, we, if we eat up that budget forever, we can never get to that next level of capability. And so we take that on very seriously. You heard uh, Cleon talking about it as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that on the next chart. So, uh, you know, there's not a lot of detail here. I, I will interesting year I, I tell my folks it's uh, I always have this chart of, uh, of the guy at the end of uh, Dr. Strangelove riding the bomb it's how I learned to stop worrying and love the rocket um, we've uh, we've done a number of studies and and we've studied uh, architectures for, for 10 years and we literally have a database of over 2,000 various architectures and we've just about gotten all the studies we've done in the last two years to where they're all on the same set of ground rules so we've got a pretty good way to compare everything um, but you see the HLPT we got going there um, looking at what the president had put out in 2010 and that led into uh, I believe it I can't really see it. It looks like maybe the heft um, studies that Lori talked about. Um, and then the figure of merit studies where we actually tried to take what we were hearing from the various stakeholders and lay that out. And, uh, and then that, that led into heft one and heft two, which laid this capabilities framework you just saw. And then um, leading into uh, the December time frame, we, we decided it was time to, uh, since, since that didn't lead in a decision on architecture, to go stretch out the corners of the blanket. And so we, we put together some internal competing teams called uh, RAC teams, you may have heard about it, where, where we literally try to take 98% of every stakeholder we had heard or configuration we had heard and, and, and put it within one of those three teams and then go compete them. And we literally uh, told the teams you're competing for beer and pizza and you would be surprised what a motivator that was to, to get uh, we gave them a, a sets of uh, requirements and um, thresholds and uh, guidelines or goals and goals and thresholds and we, we get allowed them to play with the knobs and uh, they've recently finished that report um, they've come back we have briefed that to the administrator last week um, it's an initial report uh, one of the things that's going on right now is we're integrating with our sister program, the MPCV and the ground operations, to make sure the in integrated stories hold together. Um, and so that's about as far as I'm going to go with that today. Um, I don't want to get out ahead of our ball. We still have work before we're, we're ready uh, to put our report back to Congress here uh, in the spring. There's a lot of things to uh, how you design a rocket, and a lot of people have their uh, their pet, um, what it what it takes to get it done. And you can see here, if you optimize the rocket for various systems, you get different results. Uh, it's it's pretty interesting to note that about 15 years ago, there was one of these for space station. I don't know if you remember, but there was the Boeing space station. It was all modules, and the rocket done. It was all solar arrays, and the I think it was the McDonnell Douglas had all the uh, all the trusses. Um, but but the other the other aspect of this is there are there are other things to consider in in, in today's environment other than just um, system systems engineering. You have the political aspect, and we did back then too. There's that's nothing new. Um, we had it during the Apollo program. You know when when I moved to Houston, space station passed by one vote, and it was tough. It was it was a hard fought battle to get to get that thing through. Um, so, uh, so I would tell you that, uh, that uh, and I would say about Space Shuttle too, uh, my boss, Robert Lightfoot, told me a story one day when I was feeling kind of down about everything. He said, you know, George Mueller stopped by my office one day and he pointed at the model of the shuttle and he goes, you know, that's a political vehicle. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, but, but it's still flying and it's been flying for 30 years. So, um, you know, politics is part of it. We live, we live in a democracy. And, uh, and, and it's just part of the way things get done. And so uh, I think we, we're offering the best advice we can up through our chain of command um, with the best systems engineering. Um, we take into consideration the factors that are out there. Um, but, but I do believe in this country and I believe in the de democratic process and I do believe we're going to come up with an answer here uh, that fits the bill.
bill at the end of the day. Next slide. Uh, and just a word on incremental capability. Uh, we touched uh, we touched on it, um, but you know, space station was an incremental build as well. And and one of the things we're trying to do is to swallow a development curve. Or one of the ways space station was able to do it is you swallow it in little chunks at a time, right? So you build incremental capability. And there's a little bit of talk about that going on today, but. Honestly, that's just that's the way you do it. You know, if, if you're going to build a capability, you don't build it all at once. You build it incrementally, and you do incremental improvements. Um, I got my Mac, I mean, my uh, iPhone 3 here. I noticed David's got his iPhone 4. I'm waiting to get my iPhone 5 this summer. You know, you do block updates, and that's just the way it's done. So uh, I, don't, I don't really f fear incremental buildup. And uh, I'll leave you with this slide. Uh, it's an old popular one here. Um, you know, if, if, if we had abandoned the, the, the frontier and we had just sent robotic probes over to California, you know, we wouldn't have, um, as, uh, we wouldn't have Californians today. Um, we would just have, uh, have sent a bunch of probes out and maybe data would have come back. Um, I say all this to say I, I do believe we will continue to expand frontiers as long as we have the capability and, and I believe the United States is, is one of the few countries that has the, the ability if we are to ever explore. Um, and, and I do believe um, in this country, I believe um, uh, not necessarily that we're uh, exceptional, but that we, that we are a great country and great countries do explore it. History has shown that. And uh, and I think so. And I think we're going to continue to. So so hang tight. Um, we'll, we'll get there. And uh, we've got a team that's raring to go. And and uh, one of the things I didn't mention. I'm sorry. I'll go back and mention one more thing before I get off. Uh, I didn't mention the BAAs. That's another line in that chart there. We have 13 contractors that have also been giving us um, very good ideas. Um, we've appropriated a number of them into into how we operate in the future. They've also given us some good architectures. And uh, lo and behold, at least three. Of of them look a lot like our architectures, but some of them are a little bit different. But uh, they're not finished yet, and they've got another set of reports coming out in April, and we're anxiously awaiting uh, those as well. That's all I got. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much for some excellent presentations to give us a lot to think about. So it's now your turn. Uh, we have a microphone here, so please raise your hand, and we'll start with Frank. Yeah, a question for uh, Professor Mendel. Uh, it occurs to me, if you go back to when the Augustine group was doing their review, I recall there was a famous study, I think it was by Aerospace Corporation, that looked at the likely cost forecasts, and they kind of looked at the history of, of what cost had been over NASA programs over the last 25, 30 years. We know that number has gone up for lots of different reasons. But then they applied that to looking at future programs. And almost like they accepted the past as being the expectation of the future. And I think when I think to the successes we've had in the information technology world about how Moore's Law has had a different expectation. And maybe you could discuss a little bit in terms of are we, are we fulfilling our worst expectations sometimes in aerospace or in space because we've had problems in the past and we just assume in the future and so we all start moving towards that. Um, suboptimal future. Uh, that's a good point. I'm not exactly sure what, what the question is, but I mean, I, I do think that there's, you know, I mean, more law is a strange thing. There's no reason to think that it would apply in, certainly in applied propulsion, we know that. Um, and, and then some things are just complicated and hard, you know, and we certainly learned that in a bunch of different fields. Uh, and frankly, Moore's Law probably made a lot of these large system engineering problems more complicated because now you got to deal with software. You know, I, I mean, I found in my book, like when the Apollo contractors left the back system in MIT, they didn't even have a word for software. <laughs> and it was one line in a 10-page statement of work. And by 1967, they're saying, we may not make the president's deadline because these cranky programs are giving us trouble. Who knew they were so hard? Uh, and that's something that's, I think, better under control than it was 10 years ago, but obviously still pretty difficult. So, uh, but at the same time, reliability of process, there's a lot of things that, you know, engineering is, um, I talk about this a lot with my students. There's some basic things about engineering that are very stable that people are really still very committed to. And on the other hand, if there's one thing that's different, I think, from Apollo era to today, 
it's the use of computers in engineering practice from CAD to simulation to any number of other things. And um, you know, you know that when they when they went to do the kind of LTER studies for the constellation program, like, gee, the propulsion wasn't that different, materials maybe ten percent, but computation ten to the eighth or ten to the tenth or whatever it was. So um, and again, I, I think people should just keep in mind that, you know, really nobody saw that happening in the 60s. They saw us living on the moon, they saw us living on Mars, but they did not see, and who knows what the equivalent of the next 40 years will be for that. But can I just chime in on that one a little bit too, Frank? I think you hit on a really important point, which is, you know, I'm a geologist and we always say the past is the key to the present, but, but in this case, I think we need to really understand if, if we are trying to learn more from industry and reform our processes and do things differently. How do we take credit for that at the beginning of a program as we're planning it? That is, I think, you know, fundamentally these guys, one of their biggest challenges. If we got cost models, they're great. They're based on the guy with the putty knife and the lady who I met with the syringe injecting the water, the, the, the scotch guard in each and every shuttle pod. You know, and so if we're not, if we're changing our approach and trying to simplify how we take credit for that at the beginning of the program is actually one of the challenges we're really struggling with right now. And do that in a credible way, because you don't want, because it looks like you're overselling if you don't do it right. And so it, it is definitely one of the challenges we've talked to say right now. Yeah, I'll add a little something too that I mentioned with these rack teams. One of the things we, we did, we, we fed them raw meat and said, you know, cost. It's all about cost. It's all about affordability. Go work it. And in the pizza and beer, they, they were very motivated to get cost out. What, what resulted was some pretty amazing cost reductions. The very first thing that happened, independent cost folks within our own program office wanted to take a look at those numbers, and they went and they bumped them all up. Well, if we put the NAPCOM model on it, old no way of doing it, this is how much it's going to cost. And so we we just got to reform our thinking all the way through the chain. because. NAPCOM database can, right off the bat, can force you back into, well, it's going to cost this much, right? Excellent point. Uh, I would say reforming our cost modeling five or ten years from now, I, I would think we'll look back on and say, well, that was easy. The hard part was actually implementing this the way that we... Uh, can you has what can you Um, there's some opportunity there, I think, to try and engage our communities broadly. I, you know, I, again, I come from the science world, so I'm very familiar with the decadal survey type approach. If you think about those, they are pretty narrowly focused on not just science, but individual fairly narrow science disciplines, and they're mostly uh, populated by the scientists who, who uh, care about the scientific results of those disciplines, but aren't um, necessarily in the business aspect to it so much, although we're not as pure as you might think. <laughs> I'll say that. So this is actually a really tough nut to crack. I, I would ask that we not call it a decadal survey because I think it's it's too big for that. I think we've got to at some level keep it at a higher level. I, I think it's a great opportunity and we're really working to try to take advantage of it. Thank you. We have a question back here. Yeah, I was wondering if um, in the trade studies for architectures, some of the things that we had looked at in the past was like the reusability of launch vehicles. That was a big thing in the 90s. Now we seem to have given up on that. Um, and how long can you keep going if you keep throwing everything away? I noticed Lockheed was addressing that in the capsule, but I don't hear anything of a, about it. And then the other one that a lot of been and, uh, analysis over the last uh, couple of years is on propellant depots and what that could do to uh, to enhance the architecture and the capability of the systems we're developing. Just wondering if that was in the trade space. 
Could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Bruce Pittman. I'm from NASA. Okay, who would like to take that question? Well, let's start with the... Do you want to do the architect? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take a shot at both of them. Uh, with respect to reusability on the launch vehicle architectures, that is that that there was there was not a, a specific reusability in the architecture. As a matter of fact, um, the ones that tended to be, uh, if you will, shuttle or Ares derived, we, we we went away from the reusable aspects of the, the parts you might use from those vehicles. Um, with respect to propellant depots, um, the the the. Uh, we're obviously just, just working the, the launch vehicle aspect and that was more of a heft thing from headquarters. Um, but the reports I got was that the mission architectures associated with propellant depots uh, tended, to, tended to have mission reliability issues because of all the servicing events. Um, you also ended up, we talk about chasing complexity and performance, that adds some complexity to the mission. Uh, you also end up chasing performance, which can be very high cost in, th in terms of things like cryo boil off. Uh, one of the ideas that came out of the BAAs, and, and I think I can talk about it because we, we had the contractors share their data with others, was this idea of a locks only depot um, rather than, than um, uh, anything else. So um, that's, uh, that's an interesting idea. We would pass that up to the, to the architecture folks that are working things beyond the actual launch vehicle itself. Yeah, what, what I would add to that on, uh, you know, I, I, on the first part, the reusability part, that was cost-driven on your part, right? It's because you think it's yeah, affordability. Um, for the depots, so what I didn't talk about was on that sort of road map chart that's got all the different destinations. Actually, if you look closely at that on Todd's version of that, you see teeny tiny little numbers uh, next to each destination. Those are actually design reference mission numbers. We are still working our way through building full design reference missions for lots of these different destinations, thinking about as these different capabilities come online, how you might go about these missions. Many of these missions require multiple launches, even of a heavy to-do. Um, and so in those cases, you do deal with um, the issue of storage of cryogenic fuels in space. And so that, as an issue, is very much there on the table in terms of capabilities that we need to develop. And I see Bobby Brown in the back of the room, who I'm sure will be happy to talk about what it is we're going to invest in there into making sure that we have those capabilities developed. From that, you know, in my mind, it's actually not so hard to imagine propellant depots showing up at some point in the future. Are they the first um, you know, fundamental underpinning of the architecture as we go forward right now, no, they're not. But I think that, that the, the capabilities we're developing are going to allow us to stay open to the potential for using those kind of things in the future. But we still think that the, the large launch vehicle is a really critical component of that architecture. Have time for one more question? Come on, there's going to be one more question at least. They're all on board. They're ready to go. They're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right there. And what's your song? Oh, great. Right. Well, just um, my question is about uh, for long duration missions, so where, how much effort is going into uh, sort of self sustaining uh, life support? Yeah, so a lot, um, both in terms of thinking and planning and then in terms of doing, we need to do both. Uh, so, so what Haptis found is, in fact, the, the most important driver for the life support is not the sort of closing the loop to the nth degree. It's the, it's the reliability of, it's making those life, system, life support systems really, really reliable. So that's actually where we're putting, and that's a different set of investments than sort of working to fully, fully, fully close the loop. Um, and so we're working actually in the upcoming through the AES program to, to develop some t good test beds where we can start really, you know, beating the heck out of some of these life support system components and making sure that we can um, make sure they're highly reliable and, and developing highly reliable components. So that is absolutely a big part of what we're looking at. Okay. 